Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another lecture in the Central Eurasian Studies Summer Institute's 2022 lecture series. This series is an extension of the Krika Academic Year lecture series with a special focus on Central Eurasia. If you're interested in more events like today's, please check out our website event calendar or pick up one of our printed event handouts that are on that front table. I would like to start by noting that SESI is supported by a consortium of 14 regional and area study centers across 10 U.S. institutions and thank our consortium members for making SESI possible. As a note, this event is being live streamed and recorded for our distance learning students. Therefore, it is possible that as live audience members, your voice or image may appear in the recording. If you do not want to potentially be recorded, please sit in the back of the room and save any questions or comments until after the stream has ended. Our speaker today is Dr. Tagjan Kaseneva. Dr. Kaseneva is a Washington DC based senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research, SUNY Albany, and a non-resident fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She is an expert on nuclear politics, WMD nonproliferation, and financial crime prevention. She currently works on issues related to proliferation financing controls, exploring ways to access of to minimize access of proliferators to the global financial system. Dr. Kaseneva holds a PhD in politics from the University of Leeds and is a certified anti-money laundering specialist CAMS. From 2011 to 2015, Dr. Kaseneva served on the UN, Sec General, the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters. She is the author of Atomic Step, How Kazakhstan Gave Up the Bomb. Uh, welcome, Dr. Kaseneva. Thank you so much for coming in person and uh, hello and greetings to online audience. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Wisconsin, first time in medicine. It's just such a pleasant trip. It's a short trip, but I'm, I'm just delighted to be here, to be uh, physically present at this university that is so famous for its very strong programs, including on Central Asia. It's really my honor and my privilege to be here and to speak about my book. Um, my book was released on February 15th, and, and so I had about nine days to feel the joy. And then the war started, Russia's war against Ukraine. And, and you know, as, as any, uh, I guess as many of us, I, I went in, into depression and I, everything became kind of, is it even, worth it or what's the point, right? And, um, but then I, I, I started thinking and I also started receiving feedback that actually now is the time to speak about stories like that because uh, there are important parallels with Ukraine and the experience of Kazakhstan and some of the um, darker uh, parts of the Soviet period, and, but also on the nuclear aspect, because especially with the war, um, you probably noticed that a lot of questions started reappearing. Was it a good idea that Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons? Uh, some similar questions started appearing uh, on Twitter in relation to Kazakhstan. And so this, this topic of what nuclear weapons mean and if countries need them and if it's uh, right choice to choose a non-nuclear path, they became, they came to the forefront again. And so I just hope that um, today's talk will be in, in, informative for you, not only as for people who are interested in Central Asia, but just um, as, uh, as scholars who are observing what's happening in the world right now. I just wanted to start with uh, explaining a little bit uh, about myself and where I come from and uh, what my usual work involves and, and how it meant that I had 
a really serious dissonance as I was writing this book. So I'm based in Washington, D.C. I work on nuclear policy issues. And that means that very often I find myself in settings where, you know, like high profile settings and, and diplomats, you know, mostly men, sit in, you know, like business suits and ties and they discuss nuclear politics as something very abstract, nuclear deterrence, nuclear posture. Um, and, and so, you know, one part of my professional life is observing that, observing those debates about nuclear issues as something uh, abstract. And then for me, it was such a dissonance when I started traveling um, to villages near the former Soviet nuclear testing site in Kazakhstan. And that's what I wanted to start with, just this uh, tension in my own world. Because um, if you go to the areas next to the former Soviet testing site in Kazakhstan, where the last nuclear test took place in 1989, so it means more than three decades ago, right? And even though so much time has passed, the, the legacy of Soviet nuclear tests is still so in your face. So in this photo, uh, you see one of many families that I've met, and it's a family that uh, has several daughters. Uh, they lost one daughter at the age of six, and the two youngest daughters that you see on this photo, um, the older one, she already experienced two years of struggle, fight against cancer. She's okay now, but you, you, you can just imagine, right, for a child to go through this. Um, the younger daughter, um, she's actually missing four fingers from one of her hands. And that represents the fourth generation of victims of Soviet nuclear tests. And so for me, you know, having these two realities, right, the discussions, the policy discussions about nuclear issues in a very abstract way, uh, the, you know, the budgets that are still poured into this, the emphasis on nuclear weapons programs in several countries around the world, and, and seeing this up close, and recognizing that nuclear weapons programs, they, they are not abstract. And, and there are countless families, not only in Kazakhstan, but in the Marshall Islands, in the United States, in Australia, in Xinjiang, uh, near Chinese Lop North Test site, and so on and on, you know, mostly the territories where communities were vulnerable, didn't have a lot of agency um, to to influence their own fate because somebody with more power decided on their behalf. There is also a very uh, dark racial undertone to nuclear uh, testing programs, and and so um, and so that's what we have right now, right? And I'm I'm starting from today, but let's um, go back a little bit in history. So the, the decision of the Soviet Union to really, really start, you know, pouring everything into a nuclear weapons programs, that was, of course, in response to the United States bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, and so you can uh, remember that, you, that the Soviet Union was coming out of a devastating um, world war, and uh, despite like, already having lost so many people and, you know, the economy being in, in shambles and so on, no, nothing was spared for this program. So basically Stalin said whatever needs um, to be done should be done. Uh, and um, soon after, Beria became kind of the head of this uh, nuclear weapons effort. And, and so when the Soviet military considered where to test those weapons that they were about to start producing, they had a choice, right? And they considered several locations. Um, and one of them was in Kazakhstan. And they zeroed in, you know, it, it's really 
painful for me as a Kazakh to, to think about it, to talk about it, because, you know, it's almost so random, right? Um, and, you know, when I travel now to those places, uh, one of the school teachers that I keep in touch with from the region, he once asked me, he said, couldn't they choose desert or taiga? You know, the Soviet Union was enormous, but they chose the semi palatinsk region. And so the, you know, what were the reasons? The reasons were very technocratic, technical, pragmatic, right? That um, the geology was suitable, uh, access to construction material, water, sand, uh, the location, because on one hand, um, it wasn't too close to major transportation hubs. On the other hand, there was some access because they had to, you know, bring people and material and so on. But listen to how they discussed the local population. They basically more or less called it uninhabited, which was completely not true. First of all, you know, the, the actual, what became the actual site of nuclear test. That was the area where there were rural settlements, uh, not to mention the larger area all around, um, many villages, uh, including a major city of Semipalatinsk, which is now called Simei. So um, it's located about 75 miles, 120 kilometers from the test inside. And, and as you know, it's now absolutely um, clear that this distance was not enough because people in Semipalatinsk could feel the shaking from the underground nuclear test. And people even as far away as that major city have also serious, many of them have serious uh, health issues. And so the test continued for 40 years and uh, health consequences started becoming apparent quite early on. By the 50s, it was clear that something was, um, was happening, uh, but it didn't, um, it didn't change anything. The only kind of uh, good thing, you know, if in, or less dark, or I, I cannot even call it definitely good, but uh, it helped that from 1963, at least atmospheric nuclear tests were banned um, and the tests went uh, underground and it was presented as though underground nuclear tests are completely safe which again is not true it's true that atmospheric tests are much more harmful but underground nuclear tests again you know it's even logical you 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 use uh, something that emits ionizing radiation underground underground waters and then also um, because the uh, the soil and the rock formations, they get damaged. Um, the um, radioactive gases also start escaping. And so even with the underground nuclear tests, the harm imposed on local communities continued. I deliberately never use graphic photos uh, from, um, from the region, even though there are like, there is no lack of such photos because, um, because of the reality of uh, what was happening there. I just want to, um, to give one example about how little consideration was given to people. Uh, in 1953, the Soviet Union was ready to test its first thermonuclear weapon. And in simple terms, it means that it's a much more powerful uh, weapon. And up until the last moment, they already brought the device to the testing site. They already had everything ready for the test. Um, and it was only at the last minute that somebody from the Ministry of Media Machine Making, that was the kind of the, um, the disguise name for the ministry that was in charge of the nuclear weapons program. So some mid-level person from that ministry said, you know, but what about the fallout? Because clearly this will be a much bigger event and, uh, you know, we didn't calculate the fallout. And so the, mil the, the military leadership was upset with that guy. You know, how did he dare to bring this up? 
Um, Sakharov was in charge of the, you know, he was the developer of the thermo thermonuclear device, and he, they had to, like, they had a choice. They could either evacuate local population or they could delay the test and think about the, you know, less dangerous way of, t of testing. I think they were planning to drop it from the plane or something. And so they, they could have delayed and just thought about how to make it less harmful. They decided not to wait. They decided to evacuate people. And here again, you know, it just, I want you to feel uh, or to empathize with the, with the locals. So, you know, you go, uh, you know, with your everyday life, right? You are living in those settlements. You have livestock. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly one day, military appear, and they don't explain anything, but they tell you, we will evacuate you, I think, like tomorrow, right, or tomorrow morning. We, don't, we, we cannot tell you why. We cannot tell you where you are going. We cannot tell you how soon you will come back. And so they put the people, but also their cattle, and, and um, you know, <laughs> I think it's so insulting, right, that you are just, it's almost as though you are cattle yourself. You are just being moved around. And, and much later, I was watching um, an interview with one of the medical experts from the region. And, and he actually said later on, they, they couldn't even be sure whether they moved people to the area that was less exposed. And that's, of course, you know, because they didn't calculate anything in advance. And, and for those of you interested, I highly recommend memoirs by Andrei Sakharov, uh, available in English. And he talks, he describes very well that atmosphere, how I think for him that was a turning point because there were also immediate victims from the, that test, you know, people who just died because something fell. And, um, but Sakharov, was sharing how somebody from the military would kind of say in such a dismissive way, you know, why do you have to, to worry about those Kazakh children? You know, they will be all right. And, you know, any military operation needs, uh, um, implies some collateral damage, so it's okay. And, and that was a running theme through the entire program that uh, it wasn't, you know, kind of let's kill people or let's make them sick, but nobody cared enough to think about the people and to really care that they were getting sick. And here you are just one example of a, of a testimony. Somebody from a village of Sarjal, it's one of the many villages nearby. And here I, I also want to call your attention to the fact that she says that her son hanged himself. Um, so suicides became really prevalent in that area. And again, the locals, they said that initially, you know, because suicide for um, in Islam is considered not a good thing, and they would initially bury people who, commit, who died by suicide uh, not at the regular cemetery. And then he said, but there were so many of them, we, we, like, we decided, we, we started calling it polygon disease, Balezin polygona, and we started burying them with everyone else. Um, and for me, that's one of the really darkest pages of all this. Um, just wanted to show you another photo. Um, the black and white photo, uh, this girl is actually 16, but she stopped growing. Um, the, you know, the other photo, it's a, it's, again, it's a local. Um, he passed away not far, uh, not long time ago. Um, but his entire life, it's his mom who was taking care of him and then, um, yeah, and he himself. Um, passed it, I rather, I think he was in his 50s when he passed. And of course the question is, people are getting sick, people are dying, does anybody care, right? What does the Soviet leadership do about all of this? 
Do they monitor people? Do they treat them? And the simple and short answer is that they were monitoring some of them. They were not treating them. And so just to give you some data on this, the main institution that was controlled by the Soviet military industrial uh, establishment was called the Institute of Biophysics in Moscow. And so these are medical doctors uh, c connected with the military. And, and so they would organize limited what's called expeditions, medical expeditions to the region. And it, again, it's just so revealing because now some of these documents are available and so you can like, literally look at two documents side by side, one that is written by those experts for internal purposes and they would say uh, um, rate, uh, levels of radiation of grain in Semipalatinsk is higher than normal by I think in that case it was by 10, 60 times. And then the same people would write in a different document to the local governors of Semipalatinsk that no, um, uh, no indication of increased radioactivity above allowed level for special sanitary zones. Um, and, and so that was an outright lie. Um, in, in the late 50s, after a particularly bad nuclear test that uh, sent hundreds of people to the clinics seeking help, um, the government had to do something. And so they established two clinics, one in Semipalatinsk and one in, in Uskomenogorsk. The Uskomenogorsk one, they shut down rather quickly, but the one in Semipalatinsk stayed. And look at the name that they came up with. They called it anti-brucellosis dispenser because it's true the region uh, was prone to brucellosis, uh, but in reality that was the civilian facility tasked with monitoring um, locals who lived in rural areas. And if I remember correctly, they were not, at some point they even were prohibited from uh, monitoring people from the city of Semipalatinsk, uh, not to create, I guess, uh, scandal and to control information better. But uh, they were the ones who had a study and they basically monitored, monitored 10,000 people from those uh, rural areas and then they had a control group um, from other regions of Kazakhstan. That facility that monitored 10,000 people had no, no more than 20 hospital beds. And so that just shows that it was about monitoring, collecting data, which was useful for military purposes. It wasn't about treating people. In fact, local doctors say that they were not allowed to give uh, honest um, diagnosis. And so if somebody was dying from stomach cancer, the diagnosis would say stomach disease, right? It would, so the, uh, the statistics would be also completely uh, wrong because they were just not allowed to, uh, to, to, to tell the truth. But I also wanted to, like, to share a good story from all this. So um, again, this is happening in the late 50s when it's just too obvious that people are getting uh, too sick because it's the period of atmospheric tests. And so um, the, now the a Kazakhstan institution that is affiliated, uh, with, not affiliated, it's, under, it's part of the Kazakh Academy of Sciences, uh, its director, the one you see, he's the second on the left, um, he's actually himself from the Semipalatinsk, was himself from the Semipalatinsk region, and um, he's, you know, whenever he would go back to the region, his relatives and his friends would say, look, you know, we're getting sick, we're dying, and people are committing suicide, and you are now this big guy in a big city, can you please do something? And, and he was explaining to them that my institution is tasked with occupational hazards, right? It was called the Institute for Regional Pathology, but it was more about 
like how to um, create safe working conditions at big factories, for example. But eventually, he did go to uh, to the president of the Kazakh Academy of Sciences, asking for permission to to do a study. And I think several things were happening in parallel because the Soviet Minister of Health, so a civilian government official, um, a woman, uh, her last name I believe was Kavrigina, who, is, who had a good reputation of being an, uh, um, like a good professional. I, I think, you know, because they, they recognized also at that level that um, uh, this issue needs more attention. So the Institute did receive uh, permission to, to, to carry out the medical expedition. And for three years, they collected clinical data in those uh, areas near the testing site. And uh, there are several important things about the expedition. First, as you can even see from, uh, from the photo, the, the staff of the Kazakh Institute reflected the multi-ethnic composition of Kazakhstan, which I think is an important, you know, message. And uh, second, they were so courageous because when I was reading those documents in 2000s, but knowing that they were written in the 50s, just the fact that they were recording that people are sick because of ionizing radiation, because of the nuclear testing program. I just cannot imagine what type of courage it took uh, for them to do it, knowing that they were kind of going against the most important national security project of, of the country. And so they collected that, that data. It was immediately classified. And then there was a conference in Moscow behind the closed doors with that Institute of Biophysics. And now, you know, especially for those of you who can read in Russian, everything is like, it's now available in Kazakhstan. And if you read the transcript of that meeting, it's like, <laughs> no matter how many times I read it, I get so angry. The gist of it was that the Institute of Biophysics were, was telling the doctors, the experts from Kazakhstan, that all your methodology is wrong, all this is wrong, it's all untrue, and Kazakhs are getting sick and dying because uh, socioeconomic conditions are poor. Uh, they live in poor, like they have poor hygiene and they lack uh, vitamin C. And uh, soon after, under the uh, pressure from the Soviet military, the expedition was shut down. But now we're moving into the 80s. Right? And the important changes are happening at the level of the Soviet Union, but also at the level of Kazakhstan. So at the level of the Soviet Union, you have Mikhail Gorbachev coming to power, perestroika, glasnost, more political freedom. Importantly, and for practical, for practical reasons, what's important for our story is that the, uh, the monopoly of the Communist Party is um, disrupted. So now political movements are allowed, including the environmental ones. That's one factor. Second, Gorbachev himself, you know, he was more reform oriented. He was open to cooperation with the West. He was not interested in nuclear arms race. Um, he was actually hoping, he, he wasn't that keen on, on, on the weapons program. And so you have this kind of positive opening up of space. You have a leader who is different um, at, the, at the Soviet level. And then within Kazakhstan, uh, I don't want to go maybe too much of to the side, but for those of you who follow, like who know Kazakh history, I'll just briefly say that in 1986, there was the first um, public uprising in Kazakhstan when Moscow removed the popular uh, Kazakh leader from being the head of the republic. They put somebody who was not affiliated with Kazakhstan and, and mostly Kazakh youth protested and they were suppressed in a very violent uh, manner. Um, the, the, the dark side of that story is that um, who were pro protesting were mostly 
ethnic Kazakhs, and who were suppressing them. They were sent, uh, you know, many of them were sent from other republics, and they were mostly ethnic Slavs. And so for a multi-ethnic Kazakhstan, that was just, you know, so tragic on many other levels. And, and um, it was also, as one Kazakh, famous Kazakh writer would say, that, that what happened in 86 was a slap, like on the face, for the Kazakh nation that was just coming kind of, you know, there was this awakening of Kazakh identity, and uh, there was a lot that was happening in the area of literature and theater and, and kind of the revival of Kazakh identity. And then you have this cruel suppression. You also have this tragic aspect of um, inter-ethnic tension. And so that happens in 86. But we're in 89 now. We have Gorbachev, more freedom, uh, also less discipline, within the, including in the military. You have this situation in Kazakhstan where they were suppressed in 86. Uh, and so there's a and, and re reawakening of national identity, and then it's like a perfect storm, right? You have conditions on macro level, and then it's like with history, right? Sometimes it takes for something, it, you, you don't even, you cannot even imagine that this specific event will then cause a chain reaction. So in this case, that like, last drop happened on February 12th um, of 1989. It was a regular underground nuclear test. And as I've mentioned in the beginning, often radioactive gases would be emitted. Um, but on that day, um, this information became public. And it, it, for it to become public, again, you know, all these uh, macro factors were important. So if before this information would be very like, uh, protected and there would be no ways the public would know, in this case, the military commander from one of the military towns where strategic bombers were located, so not, those, not the military town in charge of the testing program, but rather another military town, their detectors uh, picked up that the radiation level was too high. And so that military commander didn't hide this information. When the local governor talked to him and asked him, you know, was there uh, an accident? And, and he confirmed to him, yes, you know, um, our detectors are showing uh, levels that are above normal. Simultaneously, um, you also have the same information traveling to them, to the person who is with his back on the photo. He is a famous Kazakh writer, Olja Sulemenov. So he, he is both a, a famous writer, but at the time he was also the deputy of the Soviet, the equivalent of a Soviet parliament. And so this information becomes public, right? So they finally have confirmation that yes, there is radiation and um, it, underground nuclear tests are not safe. And so what he does, Because he's already a deputy, right, like member of the parliament, and because he's running a re-election campaign, he had a slot on TV allocated to him. And so during that slot, he basically appeals to people of Kazakhstan that this is what's happening, we need to stand up. Those who are not indifferent come to the House of Writers in Almaty in like three days, I think. And so what you see on the photo is the day for which he called people to come. What you don't see is that there were thousands of people. So in the hall, they could only have 400 people, but there were so many people outside. And that's the day that Kazakhstan's massive anti-nuclear movement is formed. Uh, initially, they called it Nevada because they wanted to connect with uh, peace activists in the United States. Then they added semi -Palatins. Um, and that's just an amazing story of a very powerful uh, grassroots movement uh, that um, just developed in Kazakhstan. Um, and, and so that movement, it, like immediately, <laughs> it just spread across Kazakhstan, so many signatures, you know, 
um, in support of shutting down the nuclear testing site. And that's 89. No internet, no social media. I doubt that even, I, I'm not sure if they had fax machines back then. I, I don't know. But uh, the information spread very quickly because um, they had a lot of prominent people who became the kind of the leaders of the movement, uh, journalists, for example, would use their networks to communicate with the people in the regions and so on. But also, um, and they started organizing rallies, protests, and for two years they would march across, the, across Kazakhstan, but especially in the region near the testing site, protesting the Soviet nuclear testing program. I also really love the fact that um, it, they were helped by, by uh, the international partners. So downwinders from the US would come, Hibakusha from Japan, those who suffered from uh, nuclear attacks, uh, some activists from Russia and so on. And, and so it was this very powerful uh, movement. And you can see that even the logo of the of the movement reflects, you know, they try to depict a, a native elder and the Kazakh elder sharing a peace pipe. Um, and, and, and so it's because of, I think we don't give enough credit to the movement. To, to, for me, they were, it's this regular people, those who actually marched on the streets, um, sometimes slept under the open skies, you know, because sometimes during those rallies they would be in, in places where there were not enough accommodation and so people would uh, sleep in the tents at the, on the, at the stadium and so on. Um, but I credit them with creating the, the context in which it became possible for the Kazakh leadership to sign the decree on August 29th of 1991 uh, for Kazakhstan to shut down the nuclear testing site. And timing, also look at the timing. First of all, it was symbolic that it was August 29th because that was the day of the first Soviet nuclear test in 49. But also, who can tell me why I'm attracting your attention that it's August of 1991? What else happened that month? Exactly, yeah. So you also, of course, have this kind of moment, right, when you have attempted coup in Moscow, you, like, you know, it's another opening, right, that uh, you kind of, it kind of becomes clear that the Soviet Union was kind of on its last breath, but it doesn't diminish the fact that Kazakhstan was still part of the Soviet, very much part of the Soviet Union. As you know, Kazakhstan was the last to leave the Soviet Union. But that, you know, being a so still a Soviet Republic, that decree was signed and the, uh, the, the testing site was shut down. Just very briefly, I want to, to mention about the situation today. So now uh, the, the Kazakh Institute of Radiation Medicine and Ecology that was created on the basis of that anti-brucellosis uh, facility that I described, they went back to that data that was left because a lot of data was actually removed um, from Kazakhstan. But some of that study uh, was available and they now could go back and see what happened to those 10,000 people who were monitored. They could now look at the records of death, disease, and so on. And, you know, their conclusion was very um, telling. And it's basically that, you know, it's clear that those who lived near the testing site, that they were much more prone to high mortality, cancers, and so on. But you can also see that the additional studies demonstrate what I see, like, not as a doctor, but just as a person who travels there, but they see it from their studies is that it's really going beyond. Um, I don't think, you know, except for some hot spots, the soil is, I, I'm sure most of it is all right. So it's not about radiation today. It's really more about now genetical issues that people have and that 
um, you, you have third and fourth generation of people who continue to, to suffer. So let me just have a 10 second break <laughs> before my, we move to the, uh, what happens after the Soviet collapse. And, and maybe, maybe if you have any questions so far on the, on the, like on the tests, because now, we'll, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. challenges from local businessmen uh, who want to keep the military there for helping the economy. Is, uh, did something similar happen in Kazakhstan? Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question. No, the, the setup was very different. Uh, so the Soviet military was kind of quite insulated. Um, just for example, the, the closed down called Kurchatov, where the scientists and the military who were in charge of the testing program lived. Initially, of course, they also had very basic conditions, but with time from the 50s and on, they would have very good conditions. They would have what is in Russian is called Moskovskaya Bispechenia. Basically, they had access to special consumer products and so on. They had a, a much more comfortable life than nearby settlements. So there was no like direct um, mutual communication, right? Or the, the benefits didn't transfer uh, to local communities. Um, maybe with just some minor exceptions, um, I'm thinking about that one other military town where the strategic bombers were located. There, the nearby village, their kids could go to the school there and they also could come to the town and, I don't know, enjoy the lemonade or ice cream and, and so on a very, like, basic level. But, yeah, the, in, in, in the Soviet Kazakhstan case, the, the separation between the Soviet military and the local population was very stark. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Like, I'm kind of building off that question. Mm -hmm. The military facilities that were built by mm -hmm. the So uh, that, that's a great question. So I'll, I'll start with the example of that Kurchatov town. So initially it was only the military, and then scientists would fly in and spend a certain amount of time during the test themselves. And the first few years were very tough on them because families were not allowed. Um, so for example, in that town, there would be some women, you know, those like cooks or something like that, but not too many. Uh, and it's only uh, maybe mid-50s or maybe by 53 or so. So in a few years, families were allowed. They joined them, um, and but they would mostly be, like, for example, the, the husband is the military. He has a wife and kids, and then kids go to kindergarten inside of the town, and maybe the wife also gets a job, um, but because she's, a, she's married to him, so she will do some maybe also civilian type of job. And, and so, yes, with time, these like, real, th these were like mini towns with their own culture, and if you read the, um, the, the you know, there are some websites and they're very nostalgic. Those people, they, um, they have very warm recollections of those periods, but mostly those communities would be, would be built up from people from outside of Kazakhstan. So you hardly had, it's very rare that you would have ethnic Kazakhs in those closed um, military towns. But yeah, they, they, like, they had their own culture, they had their own community, and as I've mentioned, they had um, very good uh, quality of life. Yeah. And, and just on, 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 on these families, I also want to mention that um, 
And when, so when the Soviet Union collapses, right, so you have this privileged group of people in a way, you know, it's also, I think, not black and white because on one hand they were privileged, right, the nuclear scientists were respected and the military were, you know, they had the sense that they were working on an important project of uh, national uh, interest, but at the same time they were not free people, right, that they were watched pretty closely and, but I think in general, they, you know, they had a good life. And then the collapse comes, and for a while, these people are kind of left between jurisdictions. So Kazakhstan doesn't want them, you know, because it wants to shut down everything that is connected with the Soviet weapons program. Russia is, is busy with its own problems, and so you had quite a few, a, quite a, I want to say it was in a way, you know, tragedy for many because they felt that they were abandoned by Russia and by Kazakhstan. Many started drinking, families disintegrated and so on. So there are also all those social issues that, you know, that, that happen. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the online audience, because maybe you didn't hear the question, the question was whether there were alternative sites in, in, in Kazakhstan or in the Soviet Union. Yeah, so in the Soviet Union, the two major nuclear testing sites were the Semipalatinsk nuclear testing site, and there was a second one at Nova Zemlya, so it's more in the Antarctic. Um, there, the difference is, is that they actually evac they moved, there were 400 nenets, uh, uh, ethnicity people, they moved them completely from there, and so that was the second major testing site. But the Soviet Union actually conducted some other nuclear-related tests, uh, they would call them peaceful nuclear tests for industrial purposes in other sites, including in, in Kazakhstan. It's just that the Semipalatinsk nuclear testing site was the largest. Yes, please. So when I worked in the archives, I saw so many requests from the government of Kazakhstan after the collapse that, you know, please provide us data that you have, you know, for civilians. We are not asking for military, but we know that the hospital in Kurchatov also uh, had civilians and we want to see their medical histories or we want information on the paths of radioactive fallout. I saw no answers. Um, I, when I did my research and when I went to Moscow and put formal requests for archives in, um, at the Ministry of Defense, uh, Minatam, Ministry of Atomic Energy, and um, I, yeah, I, I, I received no from all the specialized archives. So the fact is, is that a lot of information is not available, classified, and um, because nuclear weapons are still at the heart of Russia's national security and anything to do with the nuclear weapons program is still considered for them a uh, matter of national security. So, um, yeah. So um, I think it's, it's a combination. So on, on one side, it's just because in general, right, we, uh, I think just in general with Russian archives, there was this renaissance during Yeltsin when archives were opening up uh, and so on. And then I think just in Russia now, what we see is a more general culture of shutting things down and not making data available. So on one hand, it's because it's a nuclear program, because it's national security. On the other, I think it's also a question, I'm not sure whether like, the word is embarrassment, but it's more also 
question of reparations, right, and responsibility, and you know, you know, and again, you are the scholars here. You understand the difficult geopolitics of our region. Uh, Kazakhstan never formally accused Russia of anything or never demanded anything. But the matter of like, it's the fact, right, that okay, it was the Soviet Union, the Soviet, Soviet government doing it. The, the, this country does not exist anymore. But the weapons, you know, they're with Russia. So it, in my view, you do have an inheritor and you have, but um, yeah. So I think your question is, is spot on. It's, there are also th those issues of who, who carries responsibility, especially that um, people are still continuing to suffer. Yes, please. No, no, no. Yeah, the, uh, like most of them, they would come for several years. They would be sent, and then you know, yeah, there was rotation. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then now, my question, uh, the follow-up question is that: Is there any kind of collective memory space that still holds since we cannot get a lot of information from archive or hospital? Is there any kind of interview with survivors or who worked there and from both Kazakhstan side, from local people? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Kazakhstan, I, I, like, I personally interviewed those who are there and um, the survivors and the next generations. And, you, you know, in Kazakhstan, there are no limits on this topic, right? And um, so you can, there are some very good contemporaneous records. Uh, there were those before me, you know, who at the time were collecting those stories um, that I also used in my book, but I also did my own interviews. For the Russia side, what's available are more memoirs of the military who served. Uh, there is quite a good resource um, that I also heavily quote in my book, but it's more the, the angle of those who served um, at the, and like, lived and worked in Kurchatov. From there, you also get important glimpses, for example, that safety wasn't uh, good, right? Uh, you, you can also get glimpses of that there were cases of acute ionizing uh, radiation illnesses among the military, uh, but it's a, it's a specific angle. These are not, mm, um, these are not the same as with local people who, who lived there. So, yeah, you know, whatever, it, the, the rest stories that are available, but there is no, except for that study that I uh, mentioned, that was the most comprehensive study that is now currently publicly available. Uh, otherwise, it's still, it's, there is no clear picture. There is no, yeah. And obviously with this, you probably will never get a clear picture. Uh, but for example, for somebody who is a scientist, I think it would be even harder to accept that we cannot even narrate the story properly because uh, the data is so sporadic, right, and spotty. And, and so you have personal stories, but you don't have a good understanding of uh, the picture as a whole. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move now to um, to what happened after the Soviet collapse. So Soviet Union collapses in 91, and um, Kazakhstan finds itself with a you know, pretty impressive nuclear inheritance, more than 1,000 nuclear warheads, heavy bombers, um, intercontinental ballistic missiles, but also importantly, nuclear material and nuclear facilities that can produce nuclear material. And so 
I don't know, may, maybe you noticed now all this discourse about Ukraine and whether it could have kept no, nuclear weapons or not and so on. I just want to speak on, you know, in case of Kazakhstan. So Kazakhstan had those weapons on its territory, but it didn't control them, right? So it didn't have access to, it couldn't launch them, it couldn't prevent the, them from being launched. At the same time, they were on the territory of now independent Kazakhstan, and so they couldn't be just like moved. You needed Kazakhstan's decision uh, in order for their fate to be decided. Um, and I, I just want to explain that it's even more important. It, it's important that Kazakhstan decided that it, like, yes, weapons should be removed. But it's even more important that in terms of nuclear material that it actually fully controlled and the facilities that it fully controlled, that Kazakhstan didn't show interest in creating its own latent nuclear capability. Because in the, um, in the process of producing the nuclear bomb, it's the production of nuclear material that is the technologically the hardest part. So basically, you know, let's say this is the process of producing a, a bomb, I would say this is your material production because this is like technologically the hardest. It's, then, it's not that hard then to explode it. Um, and, and so why Kazakhstan made its decision and like what kind of thoughts um, and what kind of cost-benefit analysis went through the heads of um, Kazakh leaders? So, early 90s, Kazakhstan, economy in crisis, uh, like, just like full-on social economic crisis, nothing in the stores, uh, everything is disrupted, right? It's like collapse of everything. And then the region is unstable, then you have two nuclear powers on, your, uh, both, of your, uh, on both of your sides, Russia. Why, for example, I take it so personally, the rhetoric that is uh, used about Ukraine is because it's almost word by word what was said about Kazakhstan. And, you know, and they continue saying it's the, some of the commentators. But, in, you know, in the early 90s, um, it was even more, uh, Kazakhstan was even more vulnerable. So you have the northern part of Kazakhstan with um, you know, high uh, percentage of ethnic Russians, and you have nationalists in Russia saying, Kazakhstan is an artificial state, you know, who, like, who created these borders? Uh, it, it's, it's not their land, uh, and, and, and so on. And, and so you have this discourse from Russia, you also have China, and in the early 90s, Kazakhstan inherited some border dispute between the Soviet Union um, and China. And thankfully by now, you know, everything is, like everything was resolved, but in the early 90s that was still the case that you had those inherited land disputes. And so for Kazakhstan, it worried about its security, but it just didn't think that having a nuclear program was an answer, right? So what the strategy was that they, Pretty early on, they decided they, they wouldn't keep the nuclear weapons and they, they, they were not interested in their own program, but they wanted to receive security guarantees in return, right? So similar to Ukraine. Um, and that was at the core of all negotiations. And the negotiations were mostly with the United States, right? And, and so at every, um, at every conversation about the nuclear future, it was about security assurances, security guarantees. In Russian, the word uh, guarantees is the same, right? There is no difference between assurance and guarantee. Uh, and, and so in terms of substance, what this republic sought was actually closer to guarantee, something more robust. What they received in the end is closer to assurances. Um, but the important documents that were, where this commitment is pronounced in, and confirmed uh, from the United States in, in case of the first document, uh, us kazakhstan Chato on Democratic Partnership, and then the Budapest Memorandum. So the same document that Ukraine signed. 
Um, and uh, so why it became possible for Kazakhstan to make such a decision and why they, uh, I, I think it was really a combination that Kazakhstan internally with what it wanted to become and what it needed it coincided also with what the international community wanted from it and what it could offer in return. So security and assurances, Kazakhstan wanted, Kazakhstan received. Kazakhstan needed access to foreign direct investment and technology, and they understood that if they would be trying to get into a nuclear club, they wouldn't get that, right? And so, again, the international community, especially the United States, offered it. Chevron went into Kazakhstan first, major foreign direct investment, and then you know foreign business started flowing into Kazakhstan. Uh, the U.S. supported Kazakhstan's bid to join World Bank, IFC, and so on. Um, and then also the technical and financial um, resources for the practical process of denuclearization, because it was very difficult to dismantle those facilities, to remove nuclear material, and so on. On the domestic front, um, Kazakhstan's situation was not the same as in Ukraine. So what you had in Kazakhstan, the difference is, first, of course, the legacy of the nuclear test. The society was very anti-nuclear. So for Nazarbayev, it was an easy political decision to make, right? They, there was no opposition within. and then. In terms of um, diversity of political opinion, while in Ukraine you already had robust um, discourse, you had different groups arguing for different things. In Kazakhstan, it was actually Nazarbayev and a handful of people who were having any say in these matters. And, and so uh, there was no military, the nuclear industry had collapsed, so those domestic actors who could be, you know, saying anything pro-nuclear, they were just not there. There were some nationalistic voices uh, who questioned, and they, like, they, they were quite prominent, vocal, not, yeah, vocal, but they were not uh, powerful enough. But what's important for me is that Kazakhstan of the early 90s, its leaders, were, were thinking very much about how they wanted to present the country to the outside world. And I really, really love this quote from one of the interviews from the, one of the top key negotiators on behalf of Kazakhstan on nuclear issues. Years later, he said, you know, obviously we didn't want to be a pariah state. We didn't want to be a Central Asian, North Korea. And I think it's just such an important uh, factor and, you know, again, with the war against Ukraine, I get questions from the journalists that, what do you think? Maybe Ukraine should have kept nuclear weapons or Kazakhstan should have kept nuclear weapons. And without even going into nuance of what was possible technically, right? I think it's also about identity. It's about what you want to be as a country. And, um, and yeah, that's not what Kazakhstan wanted to be as a country. And so by uh, late 93, Kazakhstan joined the main uh, treaty, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, as a non-nuclear weapon state. And my final slide is just another good story. So um, oh, before the final slide, just to mention that uh, weapons were removed by 95. But I wanted to just leave on this good story. And you know, the. The Polygon, the Soviet nuclear testing site, brought so much tragedy and misery, and people are still continuing to pay for it. But um, I really like that you know now the same infrastructure is used for something good and meaningful. And one of the examples um, is that um, there is a, an international treaty to ban nuclear tests. It's called Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It's not in force yet, uh, but the system to verify it is already established. And, and so, you know, 
you need all the seismic station, monitoring stations, and you need to calibrate the equipment. So whenever the treaty goes into force, that you have everything in place, and then you can say, okay, that was an earthquake, or no, that was a nuclear test. And so the former test inside in Semipalatinsk is one of the perfect places, right, where you can uh, check that equipment, conduct exercises, and, and so that's the story of turning something tragic into, um, you know, serving the goals of peace. So I, I'll, I'll leave you on this note, ready to answer any of your questions, and um, thank you. <laughs>